All right, who is your one? That's the question that we're asking in this series, and it's more than a series, it's an initiative. We're asking this question, if you're new, who's that one person who's far from God and close to you? Like, who's that one guy or gal that you're taking personal responsibility for the Great Commission? Then we're just asking you to do one simple thing, okay? And what I'm saying, it's easy. But would you take one risk in that one relationship? In fact, last week we gave, we gave you cards and actually we gave you cards the last two weeks. And, but last week you came forward, I've got some pictures and we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you who put the cards in the basket saying, Lord, I'm gonna put this person before you and I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna trust you with the rest. And we're excited for how God's gonna use this series. It actually reminds me, I was listening to this podcast. You know, everyone's listening to podcasts nowadays. So I'm listening to this podcast. It wasn't even about what we're talking about, but they had this mathematician on. I mean, this guy has a PhD in math. Okay, so he's really smart. And he's talking about this concept. And he goes, you know what the biggest difference in math is? He said, it's not the difference between one and a million. I'm like, well, that sounds like a big difference. It's not the difference between one and a billion or one and a trillion. He said, the biggest difference in math, technically speaking, is going from zero to one. He said, because at zero, you have nothing. And at one, at least you have something. And so here's what we're doing in this series. Everybody in our church is going from zero to one. One person that they're gonna take personal responsibility for the Great Commission. And here's the other interesting thing. Uh, we, when you got in here, we put this on your seat. You're like, are you gonna give us something every week? Okay, maybe not every week. Last week, we gave you the, the wristband. The week before, the card. Uh, guys, here's what we want you to do. We want you to pray for your one. And we know why people don't pray because people tell us why we don't pray. And I know why I don't pray. The reason we don't pray is we don't know where to start and we don't know what to say, okay? So that makes it hard. So like, well, where do I start and what do I say? Well, and some of you, right, you're tired and I get it. You're tired about praying for the same people in the same ways using the same words. And so what we wanna give you is there's like 10 different things on there from scripture. There's scripture verses so that you can pray God's heart. And there's, there's like, I, we could say maybe plumb lines or sentences that you can pray based on scripture for your one. So guys, let's start today by praying together. And then we're gonna dive in to Acts chapter 11. Let's pray. Lord, we are going to be by grace, a praying church. We are gonna pray. Parents are gonna pray. Couples are gonna pray. Families are gonna pray individuals are gonna pray. We are going to seek you in prayer. And we're gonna talk about this today, Lord, but we believe that when man works, man works, but when man prays, you work. We believe that prayer makes a difference and that you have uniquely decided in your wisdom and sovereignty to use prayer as a means to accomplishing your will on earth. So would you make us a praying people? Would you use your word in this passage today to encourage us? Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, don't answer this out loud, but what does it take to discourage you? We're all different, right? But what does it take, for some of you it's not much, what does it take for you to give up and give in? What does it take for you to stop or for you to quit? Maybe you're trying to share the gospel and one person isn't interested, and you're like, that's it, I'm, I'm done. What we wanna build here is we wanna build a church that has staying power. That's maybe a modern way to say it. Here's what Jesus called it, endurance and perseverance. Here's what I want you to know, that if you're gonna try to be a faithful Christian, you're gonna experience hardship and setbacks and roadblocks, and sometimes it's going to feel like you're running into a stiff headwind as you're trying to follow Christ in this culture. See, what we're gonna see today is that the early church, if you'll type two, turn to Acts 11, we're gonna start in verse 19. We're gonna meet this really young church. It's really young, okay? It's younger than us. We're seven years old. We turned seven... I think it was last week, okay? So we're seven years old. This church is like a year or two old. We don't know for sure. We don't even know who started it. We'll get there. But the church is really, really young. They're having a lot of problems. They're also having a lot of grace on their lives and they're also suffering a lot. And so here's the things that they're gonna face because so you're gonna try to follow this. Today, they're gonna face financial hardship. That'll wear on you. You ever had that happen to you? Whew. They're gonna face financial hardship. They're gonna face persecution. They're gonna face political opposition. Uh, they're gonna face uh, the loss of a key leader in their church and the other leader's gonna be in prison. So they're gonna have a lot of setbacks. And, and here's what they're gonna learn, and I hope that we'll learn this, that the obstacles in our life, I really believe this, are opportunities for God to show up and show off. Like, you're looking, listen, you're gonna have problems, okay? What is, it's like, you might ask this question, what is the problem with my life? The problem with your life is that the set of problems in your life is never going away, right? You used to have poor people problems, now you have rich people problems, right? You used to have single people problems, now you have married people problems, right? your problems are never going away. And so what, the, here's the lesson for today, because some of you may have to leave early, okay? And we're gonna cover a lot of scripture here. Here's what we're gonna do. The, the, the main message, and I'll show you this, it arises right out of scripture, is that our problems, which are never going away, and if we're faithful to Christ, probably only increasing in our lives, our problems should lead us to deeper partnership with other Christians and desperate prayer toward God. 
It's that simple. It rises right out of the text. It's like, you have a problem, how should you respond? You should go to other Christians to help in partnership, and we should go to God in prayer. So let me show you this. Here, I'll show you what's happening. We gotta get the context. Go with me to verse 19 of chapter 11. And those, these are Christians, who were scattered. Okay, so the Christians, they go and they start sharing the gospel everywhere. Why? Because of the persecution. Okay, so here's a hardship that arose over Stephen. Remember in Acts 7, Stephen preaches a sermon and he dies faithfully. He's the first martyr, but he gets all the other Christians connected to him in trouble. And what they notice is after Acts chapter seven, the persecution goes from being the leaders and the apostles to being everyone. So here's what happens here. They traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So here's what happens. How does the church get spread into other places? It gets scattered through persecution. So here's a couple things about persecution. First of all, if you're persecuted, and we're living in a society, I don't know what the future holds, and I'm not a doomsday guy, but I, we need to talk about this now so we're ready in the future. If persecution comes, it's okay to leave if you're being persecuted. Do you see that? They left. Like, it's okay. So, in fact, you have to always, here's, here's what the Apostle Paul did. When the Apostle Paul was, this is what we can tell from Acts and, and, and his letters. If Paul is being persecuted and it's just him and he's only the one affected, then he stays. But if he's connected to other people that he could get in trouble, then he leaves. So how do I know that you can leave if you're being persecuted? Because Jesus says, if they persecute you in one town, I'm literally quoting scripture, flee to the next town. So they decide, look, I don't have to put up with this. I'm leaving. And so they do. And, but the good thing is they end up taking the gospel with them. And if you look at the verse, I just read it, they start speaking the word all over the place. So by the way, we never know what God's doing. Like you look at it from one level, you're like, oh, look at this poor church. They're being persecuted. Look, they have to leave. They have got to move. He's got to get a new job. It's like, all that's true. And God is using it to move his word. Okay, so look here. Verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch, guys, wait till next week, I'll show you this more. The gravitational center is moving from Jerusalem to Antioch. Antioch, the church at Antioch, becomes the most important church for the rest of the book of Acts. Look here. Uh, they spoke to the Hellenists also preaching the Lord Jesus. And so here's what happens. This is very simple, but I gotta set this whole thing up. Throughout the book of Acts, and this is how it should work today as well, the gospel moves geographically and then culturally. So it moves geographically, new places, and then it moves culturally, it reaches new types of people. So it was basically like Jerusalem and it was reaching mostly Jews, Samaritans, a few Gentiles. Now it goes to Antioch and it's reaching Greeks and Hellenists and we'll see all this as, as time goes on. But there's a shift and they're at Antioch. By the way, we have no idea to this day, even with all of our technology and archeology span and all that, we have no idea who started the church in Antioch. What man, what woman, what group, unnamed, becomes the most influential and first international church in the Bible. We don't know who started it. I think that's by design. Who knows the people God will use. Here's what it says next. And the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So they're suffering, but God's hands on them. How many times do you look at somebody and you go, well, they're suffering, so God must have forsaken them. Or how many times do we tend to look at our lives and we say, if I'm suffering, God must not be with me. See, here's the thing. When you're suffering, you have a unique opportunity to share the gospel with other people. Why? Because nobody cares that you're following Christ when your life is well. It's like, well, great. You know, yeah, thank God you have the nice house and you've got the nice car and you've got the good marriage and you've got the healthy kids. But when suffering comes into your life and you say, I still believe God, I'm still trusting God, I'm still following Jesus, that's strange and that's attractive to the world. So they have this huge impact while they're suffering, but here's what happens, here's what you have to understand. This church is a little church. It's growing quickly, but it's little and it doesn't have a lot of leadership and we don't even know who started it and they're being persecuted and so they need help. And, and thankfully they're gonna get it. Look here, verse 22. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. So the churches, are, you know, they didn't have texting and all that kind of stuff, but they were able to communicate with one another. And the smaller church, Antioch, lets the, them know, hey, there's something going on up here. It gets to Jerusalem, look at this. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Okay, have you ever heard of Barnabas before, right? I'm gonna talk to you about Barnabas. I may affectionately, for the rest of the sermon, call him Barney, okay? Because it's just a little easy so Barney, what, what is Barney doing? Okay. Well, first of all, his name isn't always in Barnabas. I don't expect you to know this. If you go to Acts chapter four, guess what his name is? Joseph. His name is Joseph, but he gets named, nicknamed Barney. Why did they nickname him Barney? Because if you look, what, what does Barney mean in the, in, the, in the literal Greek? It means son of encouragement. The first time we see Barnabas, what is he doing? He, it's at the end of Acts chapter four. The church needs funds to expand to new places. And this is really encouraging. Barnabas is a wealthy guy who says, I got this extra fuel. He sells it. And he's an early adopter and generous giver to a new vision. And man, the church needs that. 
Hey, we're gonna start this campus. Hey, we're gonna plant this church. Hey, we're gonna partner with this nonprofit. And we always need early adopters who say, I believe in you and I see this when no one else does. So he's so encouraged that they end up calling him son of encouragement. Then, okay, so that's the first thing. And by the way, you never know, by the way, how much your generosity can encourage those around you. We want, we all know this. Do you wanna raise stingy kids or generous kids? Generous. Do you wanna marry a stingy person or a generous person? A generous person. Do you wanna be friends and neighbors with a generous person or a stingy person? Do you wanna work for a generous person or a stingy person? It's like, well, you know the answer, generous. So generous people naturally encourage us. The second thing about him is in Acts 9. In Acts 9, this is important because it's gonna come back to this. He meets Paul. Now, Paul had a big trouble making Christian friends. Could you see why? Okay. It's like, I used to kill you guys, but I'm cool now, I promise, you know? <laughs> Didn't work too well for him. So anyway, so Barney comes to him and says, pull, pulls him aside and brings him in front of everybody and says, hey, listen, guys, I know he's got a terrible past. And this is what Barnabas is doing. We need this in our church. They, they don't typecast people from the past, right? Because we're in a small city, and I know how some of you are. Well, at the other church, they always, in our homeschool co-op, she, and in our private Christian school, they, it's like, stop that, stop that. We, you need a Barnabas. Barnabas says, hey, listen, I actually believe in the grace of God. I actually believe people change. And uh, I want to tell you that this person changed. And he has the relational weight and trust to go, hey, listen, I trust him. You trust me. Now you trust him. So he has this welcoming, it's, it's, he's responsible, Barnabas is responsible for bringing Paul into Christian community long-term. The third thing we're told here is, look here, verse, I read it already, but let's look at it one more time. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Barnabas was the kind of person a church could send to other churches. Well, that would be a good goal for your life, and one goal for your life. Okay, you're the, oh, it's like, think about this. If we had to send somebody from our church, I don't know, we're planning something in Boone, and we're like, we need to see how it's going. Who could we send? It's like, well, what kind of person do you send? Somebody you trust. Somebody, actually more importantly, trust is important, but who embodies the vision and values of the church. Somebody who is actually spiritually mature enough to know if it's a good work. Because they're basically sending them up there being like, is this prosperity gospel? I mean, are people coming to Christ? Is this easy believism? I mean, what's going on up there? They're like, they don't know. So they send a leader. So Barnabas comes up and then he, guys, this is what we want. This is what we need. Look at verse 23. Could you be a Barnabas? Okay. Like you should leave today going, I should be like Barnabas in my family. I should be like Barnabas in my workplace. I want you to see what it says. Look here, look, look here. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. Can you see the grace of God in other people's lives? Because guys, it didn't look like grace of God. Does, does persecuting look like grace of God? I mean, they, they weren't very organized. They have no clear leadership structure. They don't know much Bible. Here's what a Barnabas does. And this is what we need from you, especially those of you who are older. And that's relative. But what older people do is they're Barnabas for younger people. They come into their lives and they look at someone's marriage and they go, I know it looks terrible, doesn't it? It does look terrible. And I know how hard that can be. And let me, I actually, I wanna tell you something. I see the grace of God. What is the grace of God? I see God working in your life. That's what the grace of God, I see God. And the grace of God is always, I see what God's doing. And here's the other part of the grace of God. And I see what God could do. I see how your marriage could be different in 10 years or five years or three years. But the other thing that he does that we're not very good at, he sees the grace of God and he's glad. Some of you, you see the grace of God and you're mad. Why do they have so much money? Why are their kids well-behaved? Why is their marriage flourishing? This is the worst in churches. We walk and we look at some other church that God's using. We're like, uh, why? Why not us? So you have to be able to see, this is the difference between a servant and a critic. A critic only sees the negative things and comes in and says, this is, let me, can I take some time and tell you all the problems with your marriage? Can I tell you all the problems with your family? Can I tell you all the problems with your church? Can I tell you all the problems with your community group? It's like, oh gosh. A servant comes in and says, I see those problems, but I also see the grace of God in here. But he's not a pushover. Look at, look at the same verse. He's not a pushover because some people are just nice, right? They're not that helpful because they tell you one side of the story. They're like, everything's gonna be fine, you know? It's like, that's not helpful. Look what he does. Verse 23, and he exhorted them. Yes, by the way, it's hard to get this right, guys. Every parent knows this. Every boss knows this. Every leader knows this. Getting encouragement and exhortation balanced and living in that tension is very hard. So he encourages them, but he exhorts them. Look what he says. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. This is gonna be important because what he does is he says, guys, get in here. I don't know how big the church was, but it wasn't that big. And he says, guys, I need to take something. I see what God's doing here. I actually see this could be a very influential church. I need you guys to be faithful. Why, are you gonna, why do you need to be faithful? Because there's a lot of temptation and trial ahead. And this is gonna be an important word. Why is this an important word? Because James is about to die. Barnabas gets them ready to deal with the death of James. And how does he do it? He needs to go recruit Paul. Look what he does here. So Barnabas, I'm in verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. So Barnabas is humble enough, and some of you need to get here. Barnabas is humble enough to know he needs help. 
Barnabas is like, I'm not this great Bible teacher, and what this church needs is what every church needs. It needs doctrine, it needs theology, it needs biblical teaching, it needs a Christian worldview. By the way, that's all we're doing here every week. We're giving ourselves a Christian worldview to live out of. He says, guys, I'm not the guy. I gotta go get Saul. So he goes and recruits. And this is what you have to do when you're building the church. You have to find the right people. You recruit them and you put them in the right position. You go, you're the right person for this. So that's what he does. He calls this guy. Look at here. And when he found him, verse 26, he brought him to Antioch for a whole year. They met with the church and they taught a great many people. So they need a year of Bible teaching. Here's what I want us to see here. Barnabas and Saul, they have a friendship, but they have more than a friendship. See, Barnabas and Saul have something like Saul has with or later Paul has with Timothy or Paul has with Silas or Paul has with Titus and there's other relationships. And here's what this is. They have gospel partnership, not just Christian friendship. Please do not settle for Christian friendship merely. Here's what happens. I know how it works, okay? I did college ministry for 10 years and I was a college student for four years. So I was on the college campus for 14 years. I know what happens to Christians when they come on the college campus. If they're trying to be faithful, they're like, okay, I don't wanna get drunk every weekend. Who can be my friends? And, I, and, you know, uh, there's a couple maybe four-letter words I don't want to say, and I don't really want to hear them a lot. And Okay, who could be my friends? And so what they end up finding is just a bunch of Christian friends, and the world just looks at them and goes, you guys are just a bunch of naive, nice people who don't know how to have fun. You're kind of prude. Because all you are is Christian friends. You're, a Christian friendship is known for all the things they don't do. And this happens, oh, wait till you get a family, right? And then you want to homeschool your kids, or you want to private, I don't know. You want to do something, and then you get all worried because the culture's going crazy, you know, and... You're like, okay, I need, I need we, here's what our family needs. Our family needs Christian friendships. That's what we need. Because I need someone where I gotta be able, Sally has to sleep over at someone's house I feel okay with. So we need Christian friendships. Great. You need more than Christian friendships, not less. We need gospel partnerships. Gospel partnerships say, let's pray with one another. Gospel partnership says the gospel and Jesus Christ is at the center of this relationship. Gospel partnership says we're gonna grow spiritually together. Gospel partnership says there's gonna be accountability in this relationship. Gospel partnership says maybe you brought us together so that we could be better together than we were apart. Don't settle for Christian friendship. Shoot for gospel partnership. Look what happens. This is the result of a gospel partnership in biblical teaching, in leadership. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Why in Antioch? Well, because you have to understand this. Until this point, all of the Christians were Jews that were converted to Christianity in Jerusalem for the most part. So here's what the average person looked at. Oh, this is a crazy religious Jewish sect that follows Jesus. As soon as you get out of Antioch, and it's like, well, no one here is Jewish, and they're all, we'll, we'll see this in chapter 13, they're all from different places in the world, but they all claim Jesus as Lord. What do we call them? So what they did was they took a term that the Herodians had. So the Herodians were people who had pledged allegiance to Herod, okay? And so they said, well, that kind of looks like what the Christians have done. So they called the Christians, Christians first in Antioch because they said, you guys pledge allegiance to Jesus, which by the way, is what it means to be a Christian. See, this was a derogatory and demeaning term. This is, by the way, how a lot of terms start. So when people say Methodist, okay, that was a term that they gave John Wesley and his followers who started the Methodist church because they were really into methods. And finally, they just said, fine, we kind of are into methods. So you want to call us Methodist? Cool. And then the Baptists got the name because they baptized believers and they were, they were called the Baptists. And they said, well, I guess that is kind of true. That's what we're about. So call us the Baptists. Here's the problem today. Christian is like the most watered down, shallow, surface level title for a follower of Jesus today, right? In America. It's only used, guys, three times in the New Testament. Here, a little bit later in Acts, in 1 Peter, the word Christians used. Much more common to say brothers and sisters in Christ, followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. I, I, look, I think we can still redeem Christian, but let's just be honest. So many people say they're Christian, and they're not. Uh, like everybody over 55 in Winston-Salem thinks they're a Christian, and most of them are not. And so, so it, might, it, might be, it might be helpful to say something like, I'm a, could you imagine saying this? I'm a disciple of Jesus. People be like, and what denomination is that? <laughs> right? It's like, uh, I follow Jesus. That's what I do. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to do. Yes, you could also call me a Christian, but really at the heart, what I'm trying to do is be a follower of Jesus. So anyway, so they're called first at Antioch Christians. Then I need you to see what happens next. They, they meet their second trial. Their, their first trial is they're disorganized, they're young, they're suffering, and they need leadership, and God sends leaders to teach them the Bible. Okay, great, love it. Second one is this, verse 27. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So again, it's the mothership, Jerusalem. So they send a prophet down because they don't have the written down word of God. So they would raise up men and these men would give people God's word and they would test it, okay? So, but this is the word of God, okay? This is what I want you to hear. So here's the word of God, but look what happens here. 
And one of them named Agabus, okay, so this is this prophet. He stood up and he foretold by the spirits that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So here's what I want you to hear. This this prophet comes down and says, hey guys, there's gonna be this big famine. It's gonna affect this part of the world. And here's the thing, there's churches there. And these churches, there's probably at least two things that are gonna happen. One, um, the, the Christians in these churches, they may not have enough money, so we need to meet their needs. The second is, guys, we, we, we say this here all the time. How do you pray for a city? Well, who knows how to pray for a city? You pray for a city by praying for the churches in that city because the, ch- the city will only be as strong as the churches in that city. So he knows also, guys, if these churches, if their lamp goes out, that city's done. And the mission needs to go further. So we need to fund these churches. So look what the disciples do. Here we go. Verse 29. So the disciples determined, it was a decision. Everyone, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, so here's what they did. They were soft and sensitive to what God's word said. Now here, we're trying to build a church where it's like, yes, be strong, yes, be bold, yes, be courageous, all those kind of things, okay? Endure, persevere, but when it comes to God's word, be very sensitive and be very soft. And so when you read the Bible and it says forgive, you need to go, I need to forgive my dad. This is, I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I know, I know what God said is right and good for me and will bring him in flourishing. So if the Bible says it, I'm gonna try to do it. And that's why you read another thing and it says repent of all your sexual immorality, right? And you're like, okay, I, all right, we live in this confused culture, but you know, and I got a lot of things I gotta work on, but I'm gonna work on it, you know? And, and then you read about, you know, sharing your faith with other people. And you go, well, the Bible says it and people are lost and I wanna respond, right? So. The problem is we don't often do the same thing when it comes to generosity. It's interesting here because generosity, well, in this church, this church is a brand new infant baby church and they're generous. I don't know why, some people think generosity is like for the super saints and it's like a ladder I climb and at the very top, at the end of my Christian life, decades in, I finally am generous. Generosity can be at the very beginning. See guys, we only have we don't have that many values in our church. Cause you can't, right? If you had like a hundred values, you have no values. So we only have a few values and I'm not gonna tell you every one of them, but I'll tell you four of the main ones. Gospel, community, mission, generosity. So that makes sense. Gospel, Jesus Christ, you know, dead, buried, raised, sinless life, substitutionary death, you know, all that. We're gonna talk about that. Community, hey, you're needed and needy and get in a group and get on a team and all that. And mission, hey guys, one initiative and we're gonna plant churches and we're gonna reach people who are far from God. But then don't forget the fourth one. The fourth one is generosity. So here's what's interesting. And I want us to get this. Okay, this is so important. God, when it comes to generosity, you know, God is so wise. That generosity, what God did with generosity is he said this, the very thing that will take the mission the farthest will take you the deepest in your walk with God. Think with me about this. Because that's what generosity does. Generosity fuels and funds the mission of the church. And the church can only go as far and as fast as the generosity in that church. So I want you to understand that. But then I also want you to understand that God, it's not just about going deeper or going wider. The very same thing that will take the message and ministry of Jesus the farthest will take you the deepest. I I think I've told some of you this before. When I first came here, I had a pastor say, Kyle, you're gonna have to talk about money. And I already kind of knew that, but he said, the reason you're gonna talk about money is because it's the main thing people worship and they don't even know it. And he said, you know, you wouldn't ever go to a church and think we can't talk about sex. And by the way, those are the two areas that it's like, you know you're really a Christian when you've given those two areas of the Lord. You do not know you're a Christian because you go to church, please or you're in a community group, or you're on some serve one, attend one, or you do some devotional, or you know, I don't know what you do. You, you listen to Bible recap. It's like, you, you know that you're the real deal when you've given the Lord your sexuality and your finances. I, I mean, some of you go, I trust Jesus with my salvation. You don't trust Jesus with your salary. I don't believe you trust Jesus with your salvation if you don't trust him with your salary. So here's the thing. I'm just gonna show you this one text. It's just, I just, look, it says everyone gave, okay? I only talk about this as often as it comes up. So if you're a new guest, welcome, okay? <laughs> Sorry, it, it's, I, don't, I won't talk about it next week. I don't think, we'll see. Um, 
But uh, it, so it, it comes up, guys, and here's the thing. Everyone gave. So giving is not optional. It's not for the super saint. There's not like, and you read the verses on giving, and you're looking, is there an asterisk where I can flip to the back of my Bible and see a picture of me? Say, this, this person doesn't have to do it. No, it, it needs to be a priority. See, here's the interesting thing about me. Uh, you know, I came to Christ at 16. I'm working at McDonald's, and I, I just had a great youth pastor, so I just was taught. I mean, I was, I was making $5.15 an hour working at McDonald's. I remember this. And I was just taught, you make a dollar, you give a dime. You make $10, you give a dollar. You make 1000 you give 100 I was just taught this, and I was taught the priority of giving. The second thing, it says, everyone gave according to their ability. So this is why we teach percentage giving here, because it says everyone gave according to their ability. Here's the dirty secret, okay? The more money Christians make, the less money they give, percentage-wise. And you know who's the worst? Millennials. And I am a geriatric millennial, but still millennials, okay? Because millennials are like, you know what? I gave $100. It's like, you make $75,000. You know, it's like someone's like, well, you know what? I gave $200 to the Go Me Fund, GoFundMe page, and I almost did it anonymously, almost, okay? But I decided to put my name last minute. It's like, guys, that is not what God's talking about. Here's what God wants you to do. God wants you to give 10% of your income to the kingdom of God for the rest of your life. That's something very different than God tipping. God wants you to give 10% of your income to the kingdom of God for the rest of your life. And then part of what happens in generosity is you give, here's what it means according to your ability. That, and there's a lot of you like this. You're the emerging affluent of Winston. And so here's what that means. You will make more money in the future than you make now. Here's what you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to make this commitment to yourself. I'm not just gonna increase my standard of living. I'm also gonna increase my standard of giving because I know how you guys are, because we're all the same. You already know the car you want. It's not the car you have. And you know the neighborhood or the type of house that you want, you know. And you already know the vacations you want to take and you one day will take. And you know all the things you're going to do for your kids. It's like, well, praise the Lord, okay? Increase your standard of living, but also increase your standard of giving. Because, look, there are two types of needy churches. You think of the first type of needy church, like, oh, look at this church. They have no money or they had a crisis, or they're just getting started, and that is a very needy type of church. And then there's a second needy type of church, and it's a church like two cities. And we're not needy in the sense, we're, we're completely fine financially, 100%. We're needy in the sense that we have more vision than provision right now. We have way more momentum than money. We have so many things that we want to do, and the only thing that is, we don't have a problem with vision. We don't have a problem with people. We don't have a problem with mobilizing. We have one thing that's lacking, enough money to take us where we wanna go. And here's the problem. I, many of you in the church are very, very generous. But some of you, and a larger portion than I'd care to mention, are not generous at all. And I don't know what it says about your spiritual condition. Like, I do not know what it says that you come here and you consume and you give nothing to the kingdom of God. And so if there was 10,000 of you, it would make 0% difference because you haven't made that shift from zero to one. So they have a financial problem and the answer is the generosity of the church. And this is important because something terrible is gonna happen next. Look here. It says this, verse uh, 12, verse one. About that time, Herod the king, oh no, right? If you write down in your Bible, write bad guy, right? Because you're like, who's Herod? It's like, you're like, is this the Herod that tried to kill Jesus when he was two? No, that was his grandfather. You're like, is this the Herod that tried to that cut off John the Baptist's head? No, that was his dad. So this is a bad family, okay? It says this, look. At that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church, so here's the other thing. There's always going to be political opposition, right? Have you seen what's happening? I don't know if it all got passed, okay? Well, you, you saw it happen in California, right? I don't fully understand everything, but they've now passed this law, or it's gonna get passed, where, where parents who are separating and there's child custody issues, they're gonna take into consideration whether or not the parent will affirm the gender, identity, and personal pronouns of a confused teenager. Are you kidding me? Th there, there will always be political opposition to biblical truth. And so, by the way, this is, I want you to know this and hopefully be confident in our church in this. It's like, look, we're thinking about these things. Because part of what you realize is the, the enemies of God have a plan, okay? So we're not gonna sit by and go, I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna be you know, naive and weak and innocent. It's like, no, we're not. We're always thinking of the downside. What would happen and what would we do? 
So, so this church has a problem. Okay, look at what happens, verse two. This is what Herod does, look at this. He killed James, the brother of John with the sword. Okay, this is another thing we have to talk about. Sometimes horrible things happen in your church and you don't understand them. This is very personal for me. This is very personal for our church. If you're new, you don't know this. About seven weeks ago, we lost one of my best friends, one of our elders in a church. He died suddenly on a run. And I had all the same thoughts about him that I bet the early church had about James, which is if you read James, you go, no, James doesn't die. Like if there's one of the 12 apostles that doesn't die, it's James, right? I mean, you don't even, if I were to put you on the spot, I'd go name all 12 apostles, you couldn't. Because most of them we don't even remember, but we remember Peter, James, and John, right? I mean, the, th those three got to go to the Mount of Transfiguration. Those three got to come into the Garden of Gethsemane and pray. Like they're in the inner circle. And think about how John's and James's, John and James were brothers. Think about how their mom must have experienced it. Because here's what's interesting. James is the first apostle to die. John will be the last apostle to die. James dies right after Jesus dies and is risen from the dead. James doesn't get to write any books of the Bible. That's a different James that writes. Uh, it's like J John gets to write first, second, third John gets to write. John gets to write Revelation. And so part of what you do in these moments is you just, you just lean into the mystery of providence. You know, John Wesley said, I'm invincible until God calls me home. And so you, you don't try to answer all the questions, right? Because if you try to answer all the questions, you'll just go to a darker place yourself. But what you can't do is you can't become bitter when terrible things happen in your life. And how do we know the church doesn't become bitter? Because in just a minute, we're gonna see they pray for Paul to get out of prison. So what's gonna happen is something terrible. Listen, you're going to suffer, obviously. Here's how you suffer. You love a lot of people and you live a long time. That's all you have to do and you're gonna suffer because either you're gonna get sick or someone you love is gonna get sick or you're gonna die, someone you love is gonna die. It's gonna happen. And so they're getting ready to experience this and, now, and, and, and they don't become bitter because God didn't answer their prayer. Instead, they keep praying for Peter. I'll show you this here, look here. So he killed James, the brother of John with the sword. That's verse two. Look at this. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring, out, bring him out to the people. Okay, so here's what happened. He wanted to kill Peter also, but he couldn't kill Peter because it was during the Passover and the Jewish law said that you can't do executions during the Passover. So the only reason, humanly speaking, Peter isn't killed also is because of this. But again, it doesn't, it's not fair, right? It's like, wait, James dies. Peter gets delivered. He, he only goes to prison, but he only spends one night in prison and then he gets out. How does that work? Well, look at verse five. This is the key verse, guys. So Peter was kept in prison. This, this is the transitional verse for the whole chapter. But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. What if that defined our church? What if Blank happens, but earnest prayer was made by Two City Church. Joe lost his job, but earnest prayer was made to God by our church. Man, that couple has a rocky marriage. They've called the divorce attorney and he's already moved out, but earnest prayer was made to God by the church. Well, you know, John went in and he got the phone call he didn't want to get after his doctor's appointment and it's stage three and it's pancreatic cancer and it's not looking good but earnest prayer was made to God by the church. This is what we're trying to do here. See, here's what they do. The first thing they do when they have a problem is they go to God in prayer. What is the first thing we tend to do when we have a problem? We create a plan. I'm not against plans. You know, we, what they're, they're praying, they're not protesting. Am I against protesting? No, guys, we're Protestant. What's the root word of Protestant? Protest, <laughs> not against protesting. Um, Here's what happens with us. Something terrible happens and we think there's a technology or a technique that'll fix it. This is what young people think all the time. Like, ah, oh, by the time I get cancer, there'll be a pill or some non-invasive outpatient surgery. And this is why, by the way, some types of cancers just wreck people because you realize there is no chemotherapy that's helping with this. There is no radiation that's helping for this. We just gave you a six months diagnosis is what we gave you. And so what... What, what happened is they turned to God in prayer instead of turning somewhere else. Now, why don't we pray more? Like if God answered all of your prayers from this last month, what would happen? Would we have revival? And would the baptismal tanks be full? If God said, that's it, I'm gonna answer 
all the prayers that you've prayed in the last month? Or would the cute guy from work ask you out? And Wake beats Clemson next week. I mean, it's like that, you know, that's like... <laughs> like, we need, we need to pray. Here's why, let's just be honest. I know we're in church, there's no time to be honest, but let's be honest for a second. Um, why don't we pray? We don't pray because we don't believe it makes a difference. And, and, and let's, be, let's be gentle with ourselves for a second here. Why? Well, have you ever prayed for something and then it happened? But then you have this thought in your brain. Like half of you is like, oh, that's awesome. The Lord's faithful. The other half of you goes, I think it would have happened if I didn't pray. Or have you ever had this happen? Someone says, will you pray for me? And you say you will, but you forget because you're busy and whatever. And they, hey, do you know the thing you're, you know, you're praying that I get another job, I got another job. You're thinking, I didn't even pray and it happened. Maybe I don't need to, maybe things happen when I don't pray. Or the most discouraging, I prayed and nothing's happened. I prayed and we're still infertile. And I prayed that grandma would live and she died. And I prayed for healing and I still have this chronic illness. And I prayed for marriage and I'm still single. It's very hard on us. And so what it says here is it says we should have earnest prayer. Here's what we believe. We believe two things about prayer at least. We, we believe that prayer makes a difference. And, and of course, you're gonna expect me to say that. Like, like really, prayer can make a difference in your marriage and prayer can make a difference in your parenting and, 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 and that when, when we pray, God moves. But then there's actually something deeper that Jesus says. Jesus doesn't just say prayer makes a difference. He says there are certain things that don't happen apart from prayer. Now, that's a little bit more scary. Remember, Jesus says that. Remember, he's, he, like, the disciples, they can't cast out this demon. They get him. He casts out the demon. Afterwards, like Jesus had that happen, he goes, some things only come out by prayer. So, I mean, there's a, I think you need to wear some of this. By the grace of God, you need to feel the heaviness of this. There are certain things that will not happen in your marriage apart from prayer. Like, there are certain things that don't happen in your kid's life apart from prayer. I'm not just saying... Pray, because it'll make a difference in your kids' lives. I'm saying there are things that will never happen if you don't pray. There, there are things that aren't gonna happen in your neighbor's lives and in your family's lives if you don't pray about it. But we need to have earnest prayer. What is earnest prayer? Earnest, the word, I don't do this a lot, but the Greek word means to stretch or to strain, okay? And earnest prayer is desperate prayer. See, I think, I've been a Christian for 22 years, and my prayer life's, you know, ups, lots of ups and downs. I personally don't think that the, the center of prayer is discipline. You know, go ahead and have your prayer time and have your prayer chair and have your prayer journal and have your prayer accountability partner and have your prayer book. I think it's all great. I have not seen the needle move a lot in my life with prayer, with discipline. I think what happens, what changes prayer, what creates a prayerful heart is not discipline, but desperation. The, the truth is we're not desperate enough. And actually the real truth is we get desperate way too late. You look at some marriage, you go, you needed to be desperate about the condition of your marriage about 10 years ago. That's when the on your knees crying out prayers needed to start. Not when the divorce attorney's been called and he moved out, although God is gracious. The problem with us is we're not desperate enough for God to move. The second thing about earnest prayer is earnest prayer dreams. So it's, it's stretching, I'm stretched, and I'm stretching what I'm gonna believe. Like, you need to d dream for your one. You're like, you're dreaming for your one. You're like, so she lives in another state, and she's an atheist. It's like, well, then you're gonna dream bigger things than she comes to Christ. You're gonna pray that she comes to Christ and she leads all her friends to Christ. You're gonna pray that she comes to Christ and it finally has the impact on your family you've been praying for for years. And in some ways, actually, it's what leads your daughter to Christ, because she actually idolizes your sister. You just start dreaming, and why don't we dream? I'll tell you why you don't dream, because then you can be disappointed, and you'd rather just be in the fog. Why would you dream? Because if you dream, then you're like, well, th if this doesn't happen, this is exactly what I want to happen, and if it doesn't happen, I'm going to be so heartbroken. It's like, well, then be heartbroken. Let's dream together. Let's pray some big prayers. So they, they have this earnest prayer. They go to God in prayer. I want you to see what happens here. Verse 6, now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on, the very, on that very night, Peter was sleeping. So Peter struggles with narcolepsy. Have you seen this? He sleeps at the Mount of Transfiguration. He sleeps in the garden. He's sleeping here. Look, look here, I'll show you this. He's sleeping between two, he's, guys, he is chained to two soldiers. Some of you, you can't sleep unless it's 68 degrees and you have three pillows, okay? I know how you guys are. He is in prison chained, okay? To be executed tomorrow, he's sleeping. 
bound with two chains. Now, here's the thing. Sleep is a form of trust. Sleep is to your day what death is to your life. That's what it is. Sleep is to your day what death is to your life. You say, Lord, I've done it all. I've, I've tried to be faithful. I'm now going to lay to rest. I'm now going to trust in him who does not sleep or slumber. I'm going to be reminded every night when I need seven or eight hours of sleep that I am not God. So he can sleep. Now, people say, why can he sleep? And I think there are two answers. I think they're both true. The first is people will notice that if you look what, John, what Jesus says to Peter in John 21, he says, Peter, talking about Peter's death, he says, Peter, when you are old, someone will take you a place you don't want to go. And Peter knew he's talking about his death. So Peter might be sit, sitting in prison going, Jesus said, when I'm old, I'm not old yet. I'm going to get out of here. So some people think, and I think it's a good principle, he remembered the words of Christ, he remembered the promises of God, and he was comforted. I think it's more probably the second thing, which was he had, because what is sleep? Sleep is the picture of peace, right? When you see someone sleeping, you're like, ah, oh, it's like the, the picture of rest and peace. He had peace because somebody else was praying for him. You have no idea. Now, I don't think he even knew they were praying for him. I mean, they're not texting. They're not, he doesn't get a phone call from jail. But he, you have no idea how much your prayers might be affecting other people. And you have no idea how much people praying for you is affecting you. Some of you are like, I don't struggle with anxiety. Yeah, because your mom prays for you every day. That's why you don't struggle with anxiety. You have no idea that it might be someone else's faithful prayers for you that's actually having an influence on your life. Okay, so, so he's sleeping, now look what happens. Verse seven, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, so he's in a deep sleep and woke him up. So his alarm clock is an angel. That's what, how it works for him. Saying, get up quickly, and the chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. This is the first uh, automatic gate in scripture. And they went out and they went along one street and immediately the angel left, left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary. So he's like, I gotta go. He knew that was where the church was gathered. The mother of John, whose other name was Mark. So this is Mary, she's wealthy. We know she's wealthy because she has multiple gates to get into her home. She's the mother of John Mark who wrote the gospel Mark. Okay, here's what it says. The mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So listen, there's three things about prevailing prayer. The first thing that we see is they were earnest. The second thing is they were consistent. They are still praying for Peter to get out of prison. They haven't given up. What do you need to keep praying for? What do you need, or maybe the question is, what have you stopped praying for? Or maybe the question is, what do you need to start praying for? By the way, this is why it says earnest prayer to God was made by the church. We need each other in prayer. Because sometimes in prayer, you're believing and I'm not believing. And other times I'm believing and you're not believing. And other times neither of us is believing, but some third person is believing. I think what changes a family is not when mom prays and dad prays, but when mom and dad pray together. And what changes a neighborhood is when families pray. And what changes a city is when churches pray. And so they have this consistent prayer. But look what happens here. Verse 13. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda, her real name's Rose, that's what it means, came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate. But ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, now this is, so this young girl goes and she goes, guys, she goes back. She goes, guys, hey, listen. Let me interrupt your prayer meeting. Sorry about this, guys. Hey, listen. Um, you know how we've been praying for Peter to be released from prison? It worked. He's here. God answered our prayers. But unfortunately, they respond the same way we do about prayer. Look here. They said to her, you crazy. <laughs> you out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. Translation, it's his ghost. He's dead. It didn't work, guys. You're, you... But Peter continued knocking. By the way, he has a harder, he, it's easier for Peter to get out of prison than into a prayer meeting. Okay, this is what's happening here. <laughs> 
But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him, and they were amazed. So we need to pray earnestly, they were. We need to pray consistently, they were. Here's what they were not doing. They were not praying expectantly. I guess it's possible that even in the most passionate prayer meetings, to be a spirit of unbelief and doubt. And we don't believe in name it, claim it, gab it, grab it, okay? But we, we do believe there's something powerful in believing prayer, in expectant prayer and saying, God, I believe you're gonna work. I mean, I remember one time I, there was this wrestler at Duke I was trying to meet with. And if you know Duke's campus, it's three campuses. It's big, it's, people are everywhere. And I remember walking across campus and I was like, Lord, I want to meet him. I need to talk to him about uh, the gospel. And like one minute later, I see him walking toward me. I'm like, wow. And that's what we should be doing. We should be praying with our eyes open, looking for the answers. One of the things that will build your faith is answered prayer. And so you write, you, you have a prayer journal. Here's what I'm trusting God for. Here's what I'm praying for. And then you mark it when God answers it. And you share it with others. So here's what happens. Here's how it ends. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. He had a answered prayer story. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and he went to another place. Guys, this is really the end of hearing about Peter in the rest of the book of Acts. We hear a little bit about him in chapter 15, but it transitions. But Peter's gonna go on to have his own ministry, to write two books of the Bible. But did you notice when everything changed in this story is in chapter 12, verse five, with two words, but prayer. I don't know how all this works in the sovereignty and providence and mystery of God, but if the church doesn't pray, Peter doesn't get out of prison. If Peter doesn't get out of prison, he's executed. If he's executed, he doesn't have a ministry. If he doesn't have a ministry, we don't have first and second Peter. There are some things that only happen by prayer. And so what we're trying to do, even we, we thought, man, at the end of this, with this text and this reality, and we're trying to grow in being a praying church, a prevailing praying church, we thought we're just gonna end this service by praying together. Now, how are we gonna do that? Well, in just a few minutes, I'm gonna call up the elders of our church, okay? And the elders are, are the spiritual leaders of our church. And when they get up here in just a few minutes, when you see them, I want you to think one word, Barnabas, that's what they are. They are men that are here to encourage you. They're here to represent the church and they're here to pray with you because here's what we believe. We believe that prayer makes a difference. We really do. And we don't believe just that prayer makes a difference. We believe that prayer, that actually there's certain things that won't happen if we don't pray. But then we have like a deeper belief under all that. And we believe that God hears our prayers. Like God leans over and listens to our prayers and responds. And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is later, later. But the Bible says there's only two things that God collects of his children on earth that we have written down in scripture. God collects our tears and God collects our prayers. And sometimes guess what? They come together. And so here's what we're gonna do, guys. We are going to come together and we're gonna pray for our ones. And so here's what this means. Some of you, you know right now, like look, I'm gonna, they're gonna, the elders are gonna be up here, we're gonna sing two songs and we, I want you to come forward. And as soon as we start singing the first song, you're gonna, you're gonna feel like I've gotta come forward for my one, I know I do. But then you're gonna have this other voice in your head, nah, you know, I'm not gonna come forward. It's like, who do you think that is? It's like, you've got to come forward for your one. It's like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. You, you might say, okay, well, the, the sheet that we gave you at the beginning, well, those are some things you can pray for your one. You're like, here's what I need to pray. Like, you know exactly what you need to pray. It's like, okay, I pray that God would open up their eyes. I pray that they would believe the scripture. Some, some of you, by the way, you, you don't live near the person you're trying to reach. And you're brokenhearted that your daughter or your dad or someone lives somewhere else. And you know what? We're gonna come together with you and we're gonna pray that God sends a laborer into their life. That God sends some Christian that they don't even know into their life. Other, other people, we're gonna, we're gonna pray that they believe the word of God, that they're convicted of their sin. For some of you, we're gonna pray the Jonah prayer. You know the Jonah prayer? Jonah is running away from God on a ship. And the Jonah prayer is we pray, God, destroy the ship, save the sinner. It's a dangerous prayer. Lord, destroy the very thing that the person I love is running away from you on. So if some of you, you're gonna come forward for that one person whose name you dropped in the basket. Others of you, you're gonna come forward for yourself. And here's what I mean. You know what God has to do something in your life for you to reach this person. Some of you, you're gonna come forward, you're gonna, I need to pray for courage because I've got lunch Tuesday. And I, I know what I need to say, I just need the courage to say it. Some of you, you're gonna come forward, you're gonna say, you know what I need? I need wisdom and I need discernment because I know in week one we said give or pray, guess, go. But I, I don't know. There's like four different ways I could go and we're gonna pray for you. Some of you, you put your name down on the card 
And I don't even know what that means for you and where you are, but you're gonna come forward and just get prayer for yourself. We are going to be a culture that prays. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. Did you notice, did you notice that it gets more intense? You ask and when you, don't, when you don't get the answer, then you start seeking. And when you don't start finding, you start knocking on other people's doors. Have you seen? And so together we're going to ask, we're going to seek, and we're going to knock. I wanna invite the elders to come forward. And then just a minute, I'm gonna ask you to stand and pray with me. Then we're gonna sing a song and then I want you just to come forward. We wanna create a culture of prevailing prayer. Please stand. Oh Lord, we just, we ask, we seek, we knock. James says in his epistle, which is a terrifying reality, we have not because we ask not. Lord, and we, I believe by faith that tomorrow will be different because of the prayers we pray today. Lord, would you create a culture where we stop believing that prayer doesn't make a difference. And we start believing it makes a huge difference. Lord, would you create a culture of prevailing prayer where prayer is earnest, where prayer is believing, where prayer is consistent, Lord, and where prayer is expected, Lord. Would you work in the lives of our ones? They're all, they're all over Winston and all over the United States right now, and they have no idea that we're setting aside this place and this time to seek your face on their behalf. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.